Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 Dallas Smythe Memorial Lecture. My name is Enda Brophy, and I'm an associate professor in the School of Communication and the Labor Studies program at SFU, and I'm going to be introducing tonight's lecture. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Simon Fraser University lies on the unceded and stolen territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Katsi, the Kwikwetlem, the Kikite, the Kwantlen, the Semiamu, and Sawasan peoples. Dallas Smythe was a thinker who was deeply concerned with the question of imperialism, and that focus is one that's worth upholding as progressive scholars. And tonight's lecture will certainly build on that legacy. So my colleague, Dr. Siwon Yin, will be introducing the 2023 Smythe Lecture, Dr. Paula Chakravarti, shortly. And before that, I'll spend a few minutes or so discussing the scholar whose contribution we are here to mark today. But first, I need to say some quick thank yous. I'd like to thank uh, Kara Tews, Brenda Baldwin, and Siwan Yin in the School of Communication for assisting with the organization of this event. I'd also like to express my gratitude for the remarkable work that Am Johal, Julia Aoki, Steve Torns, Alia Bardi, and the folks in the tech support at the Van City Office of Community Engagement have put in to help with the organization and the promotion of this lecture. And I'd like to thank the School of Communication and the Faculty of Communication, Art, and Technology for their support of this event. In other words, it takes so many people to organize a lecture like this, and I'm deeply grateful to each of you for your contributions. <clears throat> I'd also like to give a very quick hello to Dallas's daughter and son, Carol Kurgan and Patrick Smythe. We're following us today from the interior of BC on the only Zoom channel we're running tonight. Hello, Carol and Patrick. And talking about the organization of this event, I should note that this is the first Smythe Memorial Lecture that has been held in person since 2019. And I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you for coming out and attending. I'd also like to encourage you to stick around after the Q&A since there'll be a reception with food at the World Art Center in this building just through this door. <clears throat> Each year, the Dallas Smythe Memorial Lecture honors a critical scholar whose work has made a mark on or has implications for the political economy of communication. Dallas Smythe was a professor of communication from 1976 till he passed away in 1992. He's now recognized globally as a leading scholar of communication processes, as well as a founding figure in the political economy approach to communication. Three decades from his passing, Smythe's work is more relevant than ever to the contemporary media landscape. His call for the laboring of communication studies has been taken up by generations of scholars, his theory of the audience commodity continues to be debated in discussions of user-generated content on digital platforms. And his analysis of cultural imperialism is a touchstone of geopolitical approaches to communication studies. Even as it is revised, expanded upon, and even contested for its own blind spots by contemporary critical scholars. Smythe's scholarship was deeply marked by his personal history and his convictions. He was born in Canada and trained as an economist in the United States before returning after being blacklisted for belonging to pacifist and social justice organizations during the Cold War. Smythe's political convictions were a constant in the course of his life, and it's exactly that unrelenting scholarship and those kinds of political convictions that we need more than ever in these troubled times. So I'm delighted now to hand the mic to my excellent colleague, Dr. Siwan Yin, 
from the School of Communication here at SFU, who's going to introduce our 2023 Smythe Lecture. Thanks, and uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm very delighted to introduce Dr. Paula Chakovati as our speaker for the 2023 Dallas Mice Memorial Lecture. Dr. Chakovati has been a longtime friend and colleague with our school. It's a genuine pleasure and honor to have Paula join us tonight in person, and special thanks to her for flying from the East Coast. Dr. Paula Chakravarti is James Weldon Johnson Associate Professor at the Garlington School and the Department of Media, Culture, and, Soci and Communication at New York University. She holds her BA in Political Science from Miguel University and MS and PhD in Communication from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her research and teaching interests span comparative political economy, migration, labor and social movements, and study of colonial and racial power. She's currently completing a monograph on media and economic violence. She's also working on two ongoing collaborative projects, a co-authored book on media, race, and the infrastructures of empire, and a field-based partnership research project on migrant mobility and debt in Uttar Pradesh, India. She has published widely in numerous journals across disciplines, in, including American Quarterly, Economic and Political Weekly, the Journal of Communication, Media, Culture, and Society, among many others. Her three books include Race, Empire, and the Crisis of Subprime, Media Policy and Globalization, and the Global Communications Towards a Transcultural Political Economy. She serves as the Vice President of the NYU Chapter of American Association of University Professors. Dr. Chakovati's critical scholarship and activism on media democracy, decolonization, and racial and social justice has made important contributions to the field of communication studies and beyond. Today in her talk, she is going to address the colonial and racial politics of media infrastructure and the U.S. global interventions. Now, please, let's welcome Dr. Paula Chakovati to the stage. Okay, um, good evening, um, everyone. Thank you uh, for the invitation to Enda, uh, to Sion, and to everyone else who has um, made this uh, evening happen. Um, I'm very pleased to be giving the Dallas Smythe Memorial Lecture. Um, Professor Smythe's work is part of the critical political economy tra tradition that gives us important conceptual tools to think through the relationship between communications technologies, capitalism, and geopolitics. And it is uh, particularly a great honor to be giving this talk today, International Women's Day, where we might recognize a long tradition of anti-imperialist and anti-authoritarian feminist movements across the global south. Um, and of course, uh, in particular right now, uh, one thinks about the um, the movement in Iran, Jin Jihad Azadi, Women, Life, Freedom, um, might, is probably on many of our minds today. Um, my talk today is on economic violence. And um, while I don't, in this chapter, uh, engage specifically with thinking about questions of gendered violence, um, which I do in other parts of the book, um, I do want to just point out at the beginning that for me, Economic violence is, um, by definition, a kind of patriarchal uh, violence, a patriarchal violence that shapes the social reproduction of labor and is born disproportionately by women, um, especially racially marked women. And so one can see the kinds of uprisings in Iran, um, across Latin America, and elsewhere um, as feminist uprisings around different political contexts, but also uprisings around austerity, uh, uprisings around um, the conditions of life that allow uh, people to, um, to, to, to reproduce their basic social conditions. And so um, 
I just wanted to begin with that, given given the day that it is today. And I thank you all for coming. Um, I'm not used to speaking, uh, giving talks at uh, you know movie theaters with, um, <laughs> and um, it's it's exciting to uh, be able to do this in person. Um, but I was saying to some of um, the other friends who we had dinner with that. Uh, I do feel a little bit guilty giving a 45-minute talk on a Wednesday night, and, uh, <laughs> um, and I hope I can. Um, I hope some of what I say is of, of interest, and, and I will make sure that there is time for um, a, a healthy and hopefully engaged discussion. So my talk today is an excerpt from the second chapter of a book that I'm finishing on media and economic violence. In the talk today, I will first sketch out the theoretical stakes of my argument and then take you quickly and necessarily incompletely through the historically well-documented cases of three U.S.-led and or backed coups between the 1950s and early 1960s in Guatemala, in Iran, and in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This chapter relies primarily on secondary historical research across four different sites, including Chile in 1971. But for the interest of time, and so we can have a, 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 a discussion, I will leave that last case out, but we can talk about it during uh, Q&A if people are interested. <clears throat> Early in The Wretched of the Earth, uh, psychiatrist and political philosopher Franz Fanon writes of the ruling species or the outsider from elsewhere who governs through violence. Drawing from his experience with both settler colonial rule in Algeria and the lasting legacy of transatlantic chattel slavery in the Caribbean where he was born, Fanon argues that modern Western civilization is rooted in an unredemptive racial violence and that for the colonized, it is not labor but rather violence that is the school of action. Writing in the aftermath of all three coups that we will discuss today, Fanon's work on colonial and post-colonial, what he called atmospheric violence, allows us to think differently about how a long history of colonial racial violence should shape our theories, should reshape our theories of the political, undergirding contemporary debates about digital media, democracy, and disinformation. Contemporary theorists of digital media and democracy bemoan what they see as a recent scourge of disinformation and polarization resulting from social media or the algorithmic aberration of our uh, shared values. Um, I'm thinking of scholars like Yokai Benkler, um, Persili and Tucker, um, and many, many others in our field um, who are the dominant voices on the question of disinformation and misinformation. Most of these scholars account for the new, bleak, post-truth era as resulting from a mix of institutional decline, public sphere disruptions, and the growing attacks on journalism, and again, our shared enlightenment values. This is a direct quote from Bennett and Livingston, who in 2018 wrote uh, an article on disinformation that some of you might, um, might know. This scholarship harks back to a presumed golden, golden age of US and Western journalistic objectivity and professionalism of the mid 20th century, defined against what we would all agree was a failed model of Soviet state control and censorship. So contemporary disinformation, uh, therefore, is seen as a recent historical rupture, taking for granted a Cold War understanding of 20th century media history and theory, which then remains a default universal normative model of liberal media theory and praxis. To make sense of today's social media echo chambers and hyperpartisanship, contemporary scholars go back to the interwar period of the 1920s and 30s when many of the white male US founders of the field of, of communications across both liberal and conservative uh, political spectrum established the theoretical foundations of the field. Disinformation and the current crisis of democracy in the aftermath of Brexit and the election of Donald Trump is thus traced back to this early period when new mass media technologies alongside the social dislocation of the Great Depression led to reforms and new modes of professionalism and objectivity that would allow a commercial US liberal media system to emerge and reproduce its own self-narrative of media freedom against communism and fascism. 
This prehistory of disinformation contrasts the unscrupulous uh, figure of someone like Edward Bernays, who would invent the industry of public relations with more benevolent figures like liberal theorist Walter Lippmann writing on journalism and the dilemmas of public opinion. However, if we think through not only the threat of communism and fascism in Europe, but the movements for decolonization in the rest of the world in this same era, our analysis begins to shift. In thinking about the prehistory of disinformation between the Great Depression and the end of the Second, War, Second World War, it has to be remembered that the global victory over fascism led to widespread popular support for political liberalization across decolonizing Africa and Asia and the toppling of dictators in Latin America. Economic historian Quinn Slobodian shows that Lippmann's an in an inquiry into the principles of the good society was the inspiration for the birth of the Geneva School of neoliberalism that emerged in response to the epochal shift at the end of European empire. In fact, the term neoliberalism was first coined in 1938 in the 1938 Walter Lippmann Colloquium held in Paris, where we see the articulation of a theoretical justification for the separation of the realm of the economic from democratic intervention, a kind of militant globalism in Slobodian's terms in the pursuit of a friction-free borderless economy. Lippmann and Australian economic theorist Frederick Hayek inspired each other in their shared commitment to the renovation of liberalism, which was facing a global legitimacy crisis in the aftermath of the Great Reception, Great Reception, Great Recession, and decolonization. Although Lippmann and Hayek held very different positions on the specific role of experts in governing complex societies, complex societies, not um, you know, pre-modern societies or feudal societies, which is how much of the global south would be seen, they shared a core understanding that the global economy was both invisible and unknowable, given the complexities of the market, which was beyond representation. Thus, best left to experts who would design the right institutions and laws that could encase the world economy. Whether advocating for a kind of liberal illiberalism or setting the global institutional stage for hegemonic neoliberalism, which would happen with the Chile case that I discuss in my chapter, I argue that U.S. disinformation and misinformation campaigns of the 20th century in Guatemala, in Iran, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and in Chile would help enforce a global color line that separated the realm of the economic from democratic political contestation. Both Bernays and Lippmann and many other influential liberal white men of their time who approved of Keynesianism in the aftermath of the Great Recession for white Americans and Europeans were simultaneously deeply invested in rescuing liberalism from what they agreed was the illegitimate politicization of the economy in what would soon be called the third world. And this was built on the colonial racial arsenal that assumes the eternal political immaturity of colonized subjects. And so what I'm going to do today is something that's quite unfashionable, I think, in uh, most media studies discussions, which is I'm going to go back quite far in, in the past. Um, most of my students think, you know, going back to the 80s is going back pretty far, but we're going back even further here. So um, I hope you've all had some caffeine. Okay. So writing prolifically in the same period as the founding fathers of communications, W.E.B. Du Bois was especially attentive to the necessary instability of a democratic politics based on, ra on racial domination, both at home and abroad. Du Bois's formulation of the global color line is theoretically important in that it offers what Jennifer Pitts and Adam Getachew, who are political theorists, call a political and analytic cartography that precedes and exceeds the nation state. In tracing the global color line in the 20th century, Du Bois shows the ways in which racial hierarchy holds together the alchemy of, demo of democracy on the one hand and empire on the other, justifying the delimitation of democracy to the world's few and generating popular investment in white supremacy. <clears throat> 
Du Bois's writing on international affairs drew attention to the unwieldy contradiction of democratic redistributive um, economics and welfare for white Europeans and Americans at the expense of continued exploitation and humiliation and ultimately violence against African Americans in the US. One note that I want to make, especially in the Canadian context, is Du Bois's focus on, trans, tr on transatlantic slavery left him silent on indigenous dispossession. Nevertheless, nevertheless um, like Getachew and Pitts, I find Du Bois's writing on US democracy and extraterritorial empire and the mutability of the concept of the global color line especially productive for uh, critical studies and communications, and that's why I'm gonna um, use that concept today. Between 1945 and 1980, most of Africa, Asia, and the Middle East would become independent nations attempting to free themselves from European direct or indirect political rule. The same period would see political movements in the Caribbean, Central America, and Latin America for political and economic sovereignty from both Europe and the US. While the early U.S. theorists of media and democracy emphasized political freedom, especially individual political freedom in relation to mass manipulation and state repression, anti-colonial thinkers and political figures pushed to expand our understanding of freedom from the realm of politics into the realm of property. So I want you to hold on to that, from the realm of politics into the realm of property. In order to, to reverse colonial and racial divisions of labor and trade that had left the former colonized world impoverished, there were recurring calls for sovereignty over natural resources, colonial reparations, and the regulation of the imperial multinational corporation whose reach remained long after political sovereignty was achieved. These calls for anti-colonial economic freedom were met with fierce Western opposition and racial violence, and over time, concerted multilateral attempts would succeed to depoliticize the terrain of the economy as a racially neutral and historically innocent domain, left best to the rule of experts. As decolonization expanded within the confines of the Cold War, we have to rethink and reassess what um, I call the US gift of free media and media freedom. We know in this period that public diplomacy institutions separated the US-based communications experts saw as a divide between black and white schools of propaganda. The media infrastructure of public diplomacy in the form of Voice of America and the USIA, uh, United States Information Agency, covered the greater white end of public diplomacy spectrum, while the CIA and covert operations personnel covered the greater black. Commercial journalism and US state-based information services adapting public relations strategies work together, sometimes in coordination and often informally, to create and support first illiberal and then ultimately neoliberal transformations in each of these four sites. From the 1950s to the 1970s, each time justified by the ruling species through tutelary theories of color-coded propaganda for those who were deemed not yet ready for democratic rule. I begin with Guatemala, where Edward Bernays, who was the father, lots of fathers here, fathers with, um, of public relations, uh, began working for the United Fruit Company in the mid-1940s trying to convince both the company's president, Sam Zemure, and the US public about the communist threat posed by a democratic revolution in the country in 1944. Initially, Zemure thought that, and I quote, the Indians, the majority of the Mayan uh, workers in his plantations, were too ignorant for Marxism, end of quote. A foremost expert with exceptional connections with opinion leaders across industry and government, Bernays was a liberal associated with Roosevelt's New Deal and FDR's good neighbor approach to Latin America. With Guatemala's US-backed dictatorship overturned, United Fruit Company wanted to soften their image as El Pulpo, the octopus, and colonial exploiter across the Caribbean and Latin America. Now, Bernays had a distaste for 19th century overt white supremacy. As Dean Serenio documents in his book, Unsustainable Empire, um, which is about the opposition to settler colonial rule in Hawaii, 
In 1950, Bernays's PR misinformation campaign in Hawaii advocated for statehood based on a distinctly 20th century Cold War racial liberalism. And this is what is deployed um, again and again in the cases that I look at. Bernays recruited Americans of Oriental background, quote, to make the case for statehood against the opposition of Hawaii's trade unions, the Communist Party, and most importantly, indigenous Kanaka Oiwi uh, communities who had been dispossessed of their lands. Bernays in both Hawaii, and as we will see in Guatemala, reformulated multinational agricultural interests overt 19th century white supremacy with a modern liberal twist. In Hawaii, Bernays' public relations campaign advocated a hollow and violent racial democracy. In Guatemala, what began as Bernays' innovative PR campaign at the behest of the United Fruit Company would expand to a public-private disinformation campaign, setting the ground for Operation PB success in 1954 that would undermine social democracy in Guatemala. Historians note that the 1944 revolution against the dictatorship in Guatemala was unique compared to other short-lived post-war democracies in Latin America. In 1951, a 38-year-old Jacobo Arbenz, a social democrat and former military officer who had been a key participant in the overthrow of the Ubico dictatorship in 1944, was elected president of Guatemala. As president, Arbenz implemented a number of reforms that expanded the potential for democratic participation by women, peasants, and its Mayan citizens. The centerpiece of his administration's reform agenda was agrarian reform. In Guatemala, landless peasants, who were majority indigenous, constituted more than half of the population, while 91% of arable land was controlled by big landowners, or directly or indirectly by foreign companies, the largest being United Fruit. Arbenz would go on to implement a land reform program, redistributing unused or fallow land held by the largest landowners. At his inauguration speech in 1951, Arbenz stated, all the riches of Guatemala are not as important as the life, the freedom, the dignity, the health, and the happiness of the most humble of its people. As historian Greg Grandin reminds us, the plantation economy in Guatemala, which was focused on coffee, sugar, and bananas, had relied on an infrastructure of police, military, jails, telephones, telegraph, roads, and judges to ensure the compliance of the plantation labor force. Plantations had their own jails and whipping posts. Planters fought any attempt by the state to intervene. The point is that in Guatemala in the 1950s, forced labor was not, as Grandin puts it, a vestigial memory of the distant past, such that the most elemental promise of liberalism, equal rights, were floridly affirmed even as they were absolutely denied. Arbenz's government called for the ending of forced labor for the Mayan majority population who worked under brutal conditions in the col colonial plantation economy and agrarian reforms that threatened to undermine the power and racism of the nation's small but powerful landed elite. According to Piero Gliese's, Guatemala was never more free or democratic than it was between 1944 uh, and 1954. In their book, Bitter Fruit, Schlesinger and Kinzer provide an accessible and detailed account of the expanding gray propaganda campaign that played a vital part in driving Arbenz from power within three years. In the US, Bernays and other PR and marketing experts working for United Fruit would work in synergy with the CIA, who would successfully engineer an extensive campaign across newspapers, magazines, and broadcasting, targeting venues across the political spectrum to promote the communist nature of the Arbenz government. In 1953, the Eisenhower government, having successfully helped engineer a quick six-week coup in Iran, which I will talk about next, would authorize PB success. The CIA would embrace Bernays' enthusiasm and place tremendous faith in the new science of advertising. Radio shows claiming to be broadcast from deep in the jungle by rebel forces were in fact taped in Miami and beamed into Guatemala from Honduras. <laughs> 
agents planned an operation, an, an Orson Welles type panic uh, broadcast to coincide with the invasion from Honduras. Operatives mined pop sociologies such as Robert Moore's The Big Con for disinformation tactics. The CIA used rumors and posters, planted stories, both in the Guatemalan and the international press, and engineered death threats and sabotage to create dissension and confusion within the Arbenz government. Oops. Oh, I can't. We've moved on to Iran, but I haven't finished my Guatemala bit, so let me finish this. Um, of course, the PR and advertising campaigns and fake news was supplemented by parliamentary support and arms for the coup that led to Arbenz's resignation in the spring of 1954, when he was replaced by US-backed liberal authoritarian leader, which was widely condemned across the world and never forgotten in Latin America. Carlotta McAllister and Diane Nelson have argued that the military regimes ruling Guatemala almost continuously since the coup in 1954 uh, 54, responded to grassroots opposition by directing counterinsurgent violence, not only against the bodies of those who they perceived as enemies, but at the integrity of subaltern forms of life and at the hearts and minds of the population as a whole. So moving on, the CIA M16 coup against the democratically elected government of Prime Minister Mohammed Mossadegh is known in Iran and across its diaspora by its Farsi lunar calendar date of 28th Murad 1332, which is 19th August of 1953. And the legacy of the day continues to shape contemporary politics, most recently referenced by various officials from the Iranian government about the possibility of US meddling in spurring the massive and extraordinary uh, brave nationwide uprisings following the death of a young Kurdish woman, Jinnah Masha Amini. We can maybe talk about this connection in the Q&A. Beginning in the early 1990s, Iranian, uh, sorry, 1990s, beginning in the early 1900s, Iranian intellectuals and political figures embraced liberal Western ideals and imagined a transition to democracy patterned after Europe. Media studies scholars, Golam Kebani and Annabelle Srebrny, point out that the democratic openings of the 1940s saw a new wave of optimism, a new interest in journalism, emerge with the proliferation of a vibrant nationalist, religious, and socialist feminist press. The period of anti-colonial democratic and media liberalization took place against the backdrop of the BBC radio also emerging as a global media powerhouse governed in the post-World War II context through an indirect mode of control by the state um, and increased coordination with the British Council in foreign sites. In my discussion in this chapter, um, when I look at di disinformation and misinformation in Iran, I look at the role of radio, specifically the BBC and the Voice of America Farsi service, which was launched in 1949, along with the expansive commercial press-based campaign, both in Iran and internationally. The Voice of America tried to distinguish itself from the colonially tainted BBC and supplemented its anti-Soviet propaganda with paternalistic, uh, paternalistic, uh, paternalistically modeled focus on modernization and democracy in the US on the one hand and promoting Iranian cultural sovereignty by emphasizing Persian poetry and music as well as respect for Islamic holidays on the other. Once again, we see echoes of the Cold War racial liberalism that celebrates a limited kind of ethnic pluralism, as we saw in Hawaii, but within clear limits. Those limits um, were, became very clear soon after the election of Mossadegh in 1951. Dr. Mossadegh, who you've been looking at here in the Time Magazine uh, cover from 1950, uh, 1951, Dr. Mossadegh came from a prominent Persian family. He held a doctorate of law specializing in finance from Switzerland and was widely seen as a liberal moderate. Here he is featured as Man of the Year by Time Magazine and in fact was seen with suspicion as a bourgeois nationalist by Stalin. Mossadegh was one of the first Middle Eastern po post-colonial politician with an explicit program of nationalization which would provide a blueprint for other leaders, including Egypt's Nasser, who would nationalize the Suez Canal. <laughs> 
Mossadegh's government was one, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, yes, Mossadegh's government was one, uh, was one of the first countries to be caught in the crosshairs of new, new geopolitical d divides between the fading imperial hold of Great Britain, who had controlled its uh, valuable oil reserves, and the emerging US versus USSR superpower rivalry that would plague the region into the 21st century. It is important to reiterate, though, before we get into the details, that the historic record is quite clear. Um, here is Mossadegh visiting um, Philadelphia um, on, one, on, on his visit to the U.S., that the Mossadegh government was largely a pro-Western administration that sought to maintain a middle path, emphasizing Iranian independence. In Iran, as in Qatar and in Saudi Arabia in this same period, colonial and Jim Crow influenced racial hierarchies and discrimination in the harsh management, unequal wages, and segregated accommodation of workers in the oil fields led to a series of strikes between 1945 and 1946, including a three-day general strike led by ordinary oil workers in the southwestern oil refinery town of, Ab of Abadan. In Carbon Democracy, political scientist Timothy Mitchell writes of a parliamentary delegation from Britain referring to the Anglo-Iranian oil company workers' housing as a penal settlement in the desert. Responding to growing worker mobilization and the unpopularity of Britain's exceptional concessions in oil extraction led to an overwhelming support for nationalization within the burgeoning and thriving Iranian media sphere. In response, the government passed basic labor laws responding to some of the workers' demands, and the Mossadegh government, coming into power in 1951, called for the nationalization of the industry. Although, as um, Mitchell points out, on terms that were much more favorable to the foreign oil company than those demanded by the Union and the Tude Communist Party. This was followed by violent confrontation between oil workers and the Mossadegh government, which went on to arrest the leaders of the Union. Anglo-Iranian at the time had little grounds on which to oppose the nationalization of oil, given that Britain had nationalized its own coal industry five years earlier. Declassified CIA documents in 2017 have revealed that only two weeks after the start of his premiership, the CIA expressed willingness to help the deposed Shah oust Mossadegh and establish an authoritarian government. They concluded that Iran was more suited to a path towards authoritarian modernization in culturally pre-modern and therefore volatile Iran. Neither the British nor the Americans could tolerate a Mossadegh in Iran when governments such as his could, could be relatively easily overthrown with, in quotes, little tangible backlash. Writing in this period, Daniel Lerner, who is another founding father of communications, <laughs> this time global communications, in his classic book, The Passing of Traditional Society, in his chapter titled Iran in a Bipolar World, writes, the Persians are a people of extremes given to extremes in temperament due to extremes of habitat, which leads to extremes in politics in which violence and frenzy of the mobs play a role. This genre of liberal Orientalism built on assumptions about Arab and Iranian inferiority and backwardness um, may, meant that officials viewed Iran as futile and vulnerable to social revolution, therefore not yet ready in matters of complex modern democratic government, governance, which led to the intervention in 1953, which was based on a narrative of preventing collapse. Why? because the Mossadegh government was moving towards neo-Keynesian policies of deficit financing to supplement loss of oil revenue. So this idea of preventing collapse by changing the internal political dynamics of Iran, bolstering up a government, it could then reach an oil agreement and forestall the fall into chaos and communism. That was the argument that was made. In 1953, the CIA and the British intelligence services organized a coup which removed Mossadegh from power and gave the Shah the power to defeat the nationalist movement and crush the labor movement and the left. 
The Anglo-US coup reestablished foreign control over the country's oil, although Washington forced Anglo-Iranian, now renamed British Petroleum, to reduce its share of the oil monopoly by 40%, with US and other foreign firms sharing the remainder. No. 28th Murad marked the end of democratic politics in Iran and reshaped the normative terms of anti-colonial political struggle in the country. In both Guatemala and Iran, the decade leading up to the US-led coups against Mossadegh and Arbenz was marked by democratic openings that fundamentally questioned the colonial past and specifically the racial divisions of labor, land, and resources held by colonial corporate behemoths like British Petroleum and the United Fruit Company. In in both cases, Mossadegh and Arbenz attempted to take relatively modest steps to redress colonial wrongs through various modes of democratic political economic reform, including the nationalization of oil industry in Iran and agrarian reform, the redistribution of fallow land held by the largest land owners in Guatemala. In both cases, U.S. media played a crucial role in securing the global color line by delimiting the possibility of democratic contestation over national economic sovereignty. In the same period between 1945 and 1958, political theorist Adam Getachew has shown that the pan-Africanist thinkers stretching from the African continent through Europe, the US, and the Caribbean developed an account of interdependent decolonization that explicitly challenged the racial hierarchy of global governance. Following Ghana's independence in 1957, Kwame Nkrumah would host the first Pan-African gathering on the continent, which would set the groundwork for Pan-African Federation and supported a new generation of anti-colonial nationalists. This is a picture of uh, Kwame Nkrumah on the left and Patrice uh, Lumumba uh, in, Accra, in Accra in uh, 1958 on the right. Patrice Lumumba was a former postal worker a trade union leader, and a charismatic anti-colonial political leader. In 1960, his, elec his election in the former Belgian colony, today the, the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, would trigger yet another US-backed coup. This time, the overthrow happened within three months of the election and would be followed by a mythically brutal assassination by the Belgian former colonists backed by the United Nations and the, U and the United States. Actually, Canada also had a role in, in this one. A, center, a century of mediated colonial amnesia might make us forget that the European Union's capital, um, Belgium, was the colonial power that ruled over the mineral-rich region of the Congo from 1885 to 1960. Under King Leopold, between 1885 and 1908, the Congolese were required to provide labor, rubber, and ivory under an exceptionally um, monstrous regime, leading to an unrecognized genocide where some 8 million Congolese have been estimated to have died between 1885 and uh, 1908. On June 30th, 1960, the then king of Belgium declared the end of colonial rule, and he, he talked about the end of Belgian colonial rule in the Congo as a long civilizing mission begun by King Leopold. In an unplanned speech in response to the king, the newly elected Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba gave his own famous speech, and some of you might be familiar with this speech, and I'll just read you a short excerpt from this. He, he said, no Congolese will ever forget the, that inde, inter, independence was won in struggle. It was filled with tears, fire, and blood. We have not forgotten that in the cities, the mansions were for the whites and the tumble-down huts for the blacks, that a black was not admitted to the cinemas, restaurants, and shops set aside for Europeans, that a black traveled in the holds under the feet of the whites in their luxury cabins. We shall see to it that the lands of our native country truly benefit its children. We shall revise all the old laws and make them into new ones that will be just and noble. He also went on to say, we shall stop the persecution of free thought. It's a speech actually that's worth reading, easy to find. 
Congolese congressmen and those listening locally on the radio broke out in applause, and this speech would be celebrated across the continent and internationally, making Lumumba a global icon. But his speech also rankled the former colonizers, Western journalists, and multinational mining interests, along with their local comprador elites. From the opening, from this opening moment of decolonization in the Congo, a Belgian-backed separatist movement headed by anti-communist pro-Western businessmen to Shombe declared the secession of the mineral-rich southeastern province of Katanga. In 1960, almost 70% of the world's industrial diamond supply and almost 50% of the global cobalt was mined in this region. It was also a copper-rich region monopolized by the Belgian multinational Union Minière, which was eager to avoid taxation and potential nationalization. Congolese political scientist Georges Nzongola Natalaja, drawing from UN archives, has definitively shown US and UN involvement in the coup and assassination of Lumumba and two of his colleagues, who would be jailed, tortured, and ultimately murdered on January 17, 1961, with UN forces looking the other way. The news about Lumumba's assassination was announced to the world on February 20th, 1961, leading ultimately to the rise to power of US and Western-backed General Mobutu, who would, rule, um, who would rule the country with an iron fist from 1965 to 1997. As with Arbenz and Mossadegh, the disinformation and misinformation campaign painted Lumumba falsely as a communist. As with Mossadegh, building on colonial tropes, the European press covered Lumumba as crazy, uneducated, ambitious, and corrupt, and even satanic, while the U U.S. press labeled him angry and domineering, and as you see here in this uh, Montreal newspaper, ontologically unfit to govern. In response to the US and Western misinformation campaigns, Africans, African Americans, and anti-racists globally condemned Lumumba's, Lumumba's assassination with large protests from Delhi to Accra, London to New York, where Lumumba's murder was likened to an international lynching. As historian Tom Bortelsman points out, it was clear to much of the world that the white supremacist governments to the south of the Congo, which were the Portuguese ruled Angola and Mozambique and apartheid South Africa, viewed secessionist Katanga, the region that wanted to separate, as a buffer against black majority rule. Jaharwal Nehru, India's first prime minister, would say that a dead Lumumba had become infinitely more powerful than a live Lumumba. The Congo crisis transformed anti-colonial militants in Algeria, Angola, and Egypt, rulers of newly independent nations in West and East Africa, non-aligned luminaries in Asia, internationalist revolutionaries in Latin America, civil rights activists in North America, black intellectuals in the Caribbean, and students and youths on all continents. Um, I'm drawing from work by um, uh, a, new, a new book by Monaville uh, about the youth movements in the Congo in the aftermath of um, Lumumba's assassination. Kwame Nkrumah's broadcast of a eulogy from Lumumba in 1961 is, is worth repeating here. Um, he, he, he stated in his broadcast eulogy from, from Ghana, uh, history records many occasions when rulers of states have been assassinated. The murder of Patrice Lumumba and his two colleagues, however, is unique in that it is the first time in history that the legal ruler of a country has been done to death with the open connivance of a world organization in whom the ruler has put his trust the United Nations. When Lumumba wished to broadcast to the people explaining what had happened with the United Nations, the so-called interests of law and order prevented him from speaking. They did not, however, use the same force to prevent the mutineers of the Congolese army from seizing power and installing a completely illegal government. Fanon's teacher, Aimé Césaire, would write a haunting play, A Season in the Congo, based on Lumumba's political assassination. 
In a recent edition, post-colonial theorist Guy Trichakavrati Spivak, no relation, who translated this edition, writes that in the act of translating the play, that she understood that the generations of post-colonials wanted to undo the flimsy European gift of nation identification and create a real force in the world where a new kind of regionalism would undo cultural essentialisms. It did not succeed, but that failure was not final. Fanon writes that for centuries, the capitalists have behaved like real war criminals in the underdeveloped world, and that their moral reparation for national independence does not fool us, and it does not feed us. The wealth of the imperialist nation, he argued, is also our wealth. Like most anti-colonial thinkers of his time, Fanon recognized that in the 20th century, Americans espousing self-determination de on one hand take their role as the barons of international capitalism seriously, replacing brute force as the primary mechanism of colonial rule in capitalist societies, extending to post-colonial capitalist societies, Fanon writes of the role of what he calls cultural bewilderers, perhaps a more fitting title for advertising and public relations experts or marketing influencers of today. Colonial and post-colonial violence thus maintained for Fanon what was most valuable because it, it was the most concrete objective of colonial rule, control over land. The land which will bring them, the colonized people, bred and above all dignity. Here Fanon clarifies in the same section where he highlighted the central value of land to any concept of anti-colonial freedom that this dignity has nothing to do with the dignity of the human individual. For that human individual has never heard tell of it. All the native has seen in his country is that they can freely arrest him, beat him, starve him, and no professor of ethics, no priest has ever come to be beaten in his place, nor to share their bread with him. For Fanon and other anti-colonial theorists, understanding of 20th century democracy and thereby debates about media and democracy must begin with violence. The dominant contemporary scholarship on media and democracy continues to insist that there is a substantive gap between media freedom and autonomy when it comes to foreign versus domestic coverage, but it tends to see this gap as cursory to its larger theoretical claims and stakes. Current discussions of networked media systems assume that press freedom and autonomy is based on freedom to interpret that ideally helps readers relate to stories or understand possible interpretations and appreciate their shared social conditions. That, this is a quote from a book by Mike uh, Anony on network journalism, but really it is indicative of the way that um, uh, people who are studying network journalism and disinformation understand um, our thoughts about disinformation and uh, democracy. So what I'm saying is, in other words, that most theories of me media and democracy insist that press freedom and autonomy ought to be assessed within the framework of a homogenous nation state assuming that U.S. media is more likely to align its interests with the state when it comes to few more minutes, um, that it's more likely to align its interests with, uh, with the state when it comes to questions of political conflict and war. This approach does not see the global color line, and that has been the analytic frame of my presentation today. Beyond the limitations of methodological nationalism in studying media and technology infrastructures that are by design global, we have to recognize the theories of free commercial media and objective journalism were themselves forged in the mid-20th century in the context of three-sided conflict of the Cold War. This includes the most under-theorized of the three sites for media studies scholars today, the site of decolonization and self-determination. In a prescient essay published in 1944 in the American Journal of Sociology, Prospects for a World Without Race Conflict, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois writes, our attitude towards poverty represents the constant lesion of race thinking. The turn towards Keynesian economics of redistribution in the U.S. and Western Europe meant the abolition of poverty was now imaginable for whites, but remained unthinkable for the majority of the world's racialized and seemingly disposable poor despite their political freedom from direct colonial rule. <laughs> 
This talk has been a rushed attempt to map an alternate genealogy of the roots of contemporary disinformation, misinformation, across these interventions which helped enforce a global color line and um, it, it, that, that established to prevent the, uh, the global color line which was established to prevent the abolition of poverty. This constant lesion of race thinking, like Lumumba's ghost, continues to haunt us in our diminished understanding of media freedom and free media. Um, one of the things I wanted to close on is to sort of think about the contemporary consequences of the argument that I'm making about economic violence in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and, uh, Maybe that's something that we can we can talk about in the Q and A. But I would say that the the point of this intervention is actually to um, confront um, the legacy of colonial racial misinformation and disinformation in discussions today, in order for us to have a more fulsome debate about radical democratic political movements. Um, and and in fact, it it it. By avoiding this history, we um, end up reinforcing the kinds of attacks on democratic possibilities, especially in the global south. Um, and the other dimension that I think is important is really to think about the ways in which this kind of argument about um, the limitation of the contestation of uh, uh, the democratic contestation of the economy um, through this racial colonial lens continues to haunt us when we think about the aftermath of the post-COVID world we live in, where um, conditions of austerity continue to guide the lives of, of uh, you know, the majority of humanity, and you see the kind of racialized debt crises and migrant crises um, that we are faced with. And so attempting to, to think back um, uh, historically um, to the roots of some of these, um, uh, the, the kind of current condition we're in and not romanticize a kind of ideal mediated, mediatized past, um, I think would help us um, make some progress towards that, um, that, that possibility. So I thank you for your time and your attention. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Paula, for such an engaging, inspiring, and thought-provoking talk. Uh, I've learned a lot. Um, as you said, this very revealing historical analysis accounts definitely uh, on, on the uh, U.S. global uh, in interventions, expansions in, in the past, uh, carry very important implications for us to maybe better understand this very continuing violence and destruction backed by the uh, military power, financial institutions, and of course media from global north, uh, led by the states, which have devastating impact on people's life in the global south. And of course, on working populations, racial minorities, migrant workers in the global uh, north. So uh, now we like to, we have some very good time left. We like to invite uh, questions and comments and thoughts for Paula. From the audience, please. Um, we'll have staff member help us pass around the mic. Any, can't really see, it's a little bit darker over there. We have, the, um, anyone passing Mac over there? Yes, uh, we have Daniel and then Wendy. Um, I, there's, okay, thank you. Is it working? Okay. Um, thank you, Paula, for that um, a really engaging talk. Um, I have a question about uh, your segment about Iran and given the history that you talked about. And also uh, in terms of, um, I think a lot of what you're saying, it resonates today as well with what's happening, especially the backlash against the progressive left, uh, both by... Um, to some degree, people inside Iran, but uh, more so the diaspora that is often influenced by um, sort of Western interventions, including media intervention. 
Uh, I'm just wondering, based on um, your research, how do you situate what's going on in Iran these days in terms of both? Uh, and I know we don't have a crystal ball and to say, you know, what the future will hold for this movement. But what is your take on uh, what's going on in Iran today in terms of um, both the movement itself and the backlash um, that it's been facing from um, the sort of some of the less progressive uh, voices around the world? Thanks. Can you, you can all hear me on this mic, right? Um, thank you so much for that question. And of course, um, you're asking me as an Iran specialist about, <laughs> about this. Um, so I will just give you my um, general impression and obviously um, welcome a conversation. I think, um, I think what I'm trying to show in all of the cases is that um, you know, the, the impact of these coups um, had um, national, regional, and global consequences. And so one of the reasons why it's important for us in communications to think, uh, think through these coups as opposed to thinking through, for example, wars, um, is that if, it, so one of the stories that theories of media and democracy, um, which are mostly rooted in the West and the US, likes to tell about itself is that the Vietnam War and the kind of turn that we saw as a role of critical, as a result of critical media coverage of the war, demonstrates that liberal commercial media systems are accountable and that they can change, they can be dynamic. And you know, this is the criticism, this is the response to a, say, a Chomsky and Herman kind of critique of the structural power of media. Um, and I think what looking at these counterinsurgencies and coups allow us to think through is that those were successful, right? And they were successful because they were successful in, um, in different ways. You know, in Iran, you have this, um, you know, you have 1979 and of course, you know, the Green Revolution, ongoing movement. Um, but they were successful in in shrinking the parameters of politics, you know, and, and, and changing the kind of uh, debate that was uh, permissible. Um, in Guatemala, you know, the, the story is much, you know, Guatemala and the and Democratic Republic of Congo, it's much, it's a much more grim picture, right? Um, you're talking about genocidal violence in, 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 in Guatemala in the 1980s, for example. So in Iran, I mean, I, I would say out of the four cases, Iran and Chile offer some hope in different ways, right? Um, the Iran case, I feel, um, you know, as I mentioned just early in my, um, in my remarks, um, I, f I feel that, you know, we live in grim political times for much, most of the world. Um, but where there is hope um, for me, where I see some possibilities of, 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 of larger scale transformation are actually places where you have a kind of feminist led and often feminist and minoritized, as you see in Iran with Kurdish feminists leading, um, you know, where you actually have people who are leading the political movements in a sense because the kind of conditions of reproducing their life are, are you know, not there, you know? And so th there's a kind of urgency um, and, and, and a lack of fear, because I think this is the, the, the collective, um, this is the collective legacy of these kinds of interventions is the kind of fear that is put in people's minds about the possibility of a politics outside of these narrow parameters. So I think you see that in Iran, um, and I, I think that that's very, um, hopeful, but, um, but you know, the, the geopolitical condition has changed. And so we no longer live in a bipolar world. We live in a multipolar world. And there are, so it is not just about the US in relation to Iran or you know, the first world in relation to the third world. Um, you have many other authoritarian regional powers interested in keeping regions authoritarian. And so it becomes much more complex, right? And so the, the kind of 
um, the, the, the story that I want to tell through the longer book really is, is about the kind of transformation of imperial politics, right, which, 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 which transforms. Um, let's just say I'm more hopeful about Iran than India right now. So I suppose I would put it that way. And then I think that the movement internally is, um, is remarkable and inspiring. And I agree with you that the diasporic politics is complicated and, and, and as all, all of you know, requires a kind of care um, um, and attention to how it is mediated that I think, um, that, well, that you're much more aware of than me. Hi, um, thank you for a really wonderful talk. I was wondering, um, as you're thinking through the Cold War moment and the importance of this, if you've considered actually the, sorry, there's a horrible feedback. I think it's my phone, I'll put it away. Um, if you've considered uh, the World War II period, because um, it's, it's really inspiring that you think through Du Bois and the way that he's trying to relate and not the, the situation within the US to the global color mm -hmm. line. Um, and then during World War II, especially if you think through the history and emergence of the social sciences um, and its work through the Japanese internment camps, um, you have there uh, the sort of uh, model not only for techniques of disinformation, but the very techniques that social media companies will take up. Um, in terms of surveillance, in terms of the quote unquote uh, liberal um, uh, racism, and even the, the formulation of what the US global policy will look like going forward. And so um, I don't know how far back your book goes, but to think through the sort of World War II moment as, as precisely trying to understand that global, um, local, racial politics and linking it to a sort of democratic liberalism that will then go off. Yeah, um, I am. I mean, that's a that's a really that's a great point, and it's very important to think about um, to think about the way in which um, internment um, and the um, the kind the the racial the domestic racial politics plays out differently across different groups at that moment, and then how it is um, uh, refracted um, globally. Um, I. Um, most of the book, uh, it really begins post-World War II. Um, I'm looking at the kind of 1950s, really, as, as the kind of beginning of the story that I'm telling. Um, but I, um, you know, the reason I started with the Edward Bernays and Walter Lippmann uh, debate um, is precisely because Contemporary theories of disinformation go back to that period, but they don't look at the kind of racial uh, colonial history um, that is being both reimagined by the US as it becomes the global power um, and as it's being contested, right, in this period, because World War II is also a period, the, that period is really important as in terms of anti-colonial movements across uh, across the world, right? They don't just start in 1945. Um, they're building from the 30s and 40s, et cetera, 20s. Um, so part of my hope in, with this project is to, to, you know, tell this part of the story, you know, uh, through, the, through, through the book that um, I'm writing. But I'm also just hoping that this, um, and I'm not the only person, there's other people making these kinds of interventions, but I, I, I hope that it pushes us to rethink our, th our theories, not just about disinformation and democracy, but about media and democracy um, uh, much, more, much more widely outside of how, um, uh, how narrowly it has been conceived and, and how narrow the normative parameters have been. So I think what you're, you know, so I'm, what you mentioned about the, inter uh, the internship, the, the camps, the internment camps, um, sometimes I think about internship camps. Internment camps is, um, is, is, is extremely important, as is, for example, the work of Simone Brown on you know, chattel slavery and surveillance. I mean, I think there are many ways in which we have to rethink some of these core theoretical understandings in media studies through this kind of contradictory uh, history um, of both 
promising democracy, promising economic inclusion on the one hand, and, and its opposite, right? Um, whether we think about the history of slavery, whether we think about indigenous dispossession, whether we think about the history of um, internment camps, whether we think about uh, racialized migration policies, um, whether we think about extraterritorial empire, which for the U.S. begins in 1898. You know, so there's, there's so many different ways that we have to kind of remap um, our kind of core normative understandings um, that thus far have placed um, a, a one version of um, Euro-American history at its center. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, work to be done that's being done um, right now. So yeah, that would be my convoluted answer to your question. We have a hand over there. Paula, thank you very much for your speech tonight and for your work ongoing. Um, it's quite inspiring. Um, my question relates to uh, the idea that in the West we've developed journalism around a liberal idea of, of a fourth estate and this idea to critique. Um, in my research, I compare it against uh, the media in China, which uh, follows a, a Leninist model mm -hmm. with this idea of informing people to bring them in, um, Lenin's collective organizer. You painted a wonderful picture of how uh, liberal media has also worked a little bit as a collective organizer, especially along these racial lines. Um, I wonder, uh, Inspired by your work on transculturalism and political economy, um, looking at how liberal media has been unable to build international solidarity and to promote uh, a peacetime internationalism that's outside of liberal domination, um, how might we reflect on journalist practices moving forward? Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that question. I don't know. I have to think a little bit about it. I mean, I... Um, I think one of the things that I'm trying to say in this, um, with this chapter in particular in the book, um, is that um, the kind of, you know, the idea that we have of media freedom, right? And I mean, you're talking about a very different history of journalism in China, and actually a very different history of journalism in, in much of the world, right? Especially when we think of the relationship between journalism as an institution and the state. Um, the, in communications, we often don't really theorize the state as some that, that can be institutionally distinct. You can have different kinds of state power, you can have different forms of democracy, um, and of course you, you have authoritarianism, but it's not all the same, right? And so the relationship of the media to these different um, political cultures and political economic histories is important to think through. But I guess uh, the, my point here is this, um, this idea of media freedom as individual freedom to critique the state, right? Which is the kind of dominant, to critique institutional power, but really the state, right? Which is the kind of American idea of media freedom. You, and, you know, it's true for Edward Bernays and Walter Lippmann, as it is true for Elon Musk, you know, this kind of idea. And so from both liberal and conservatives who understand media freedom as the ability for individuals to critique the state. Um, what I want to try and show here is that, um, that there are other mo modalities of freedom, right? In the During the Cold War, we thought of it in terms of positive and negative freedom. Um, that are actually, um, the constructs themselves are quite racialized, you know? So you have um, theorists of positive and negative freedom who would basically argue that positive freedom um, was not a racially viable um, option for most of the colonized um, world because there, there was no capacity um, to um, uh, implement uh, policies that um, would lead to the kind of equity that you have in more developed societies, you know? And so the pushing out, or not the pushing out, the kind of shrinking of the parameters of freedom in our discussions about journalism and media is, is, is what I'm interested in tracing, um, um, you know, in, the, in this period, you know, from in, in, this, in this discussion from the 1950s to the 1970s. 
Um, and then actually my book moves away from journalism, since I'm not really a scholar of journalism. Um, I move away from journalism and I look at other types of media infrastructures, telecommunications and computing and the governance of different kinds of media. Because I, I want to show the, the, the modality of, of racial economic violence across and not just in journalism. And so I sort of, you know, I sort of move away from that. Um, but that's a good question. I mean, what are the other models that are viable? Um, uh, is something I think we have to we have to think about today. I mean, I just think that the normative battle has been lost um, on this more expansive notion of media justice, for example. You know, in the in the contemporary moment that we live in, and this narrower idea of individualized media freedom is what we what we have. You know, um, and to the detriment, I think, of um, you know of <laughs> most people on the planet. So. Um, so yeah, I think there's um it's not a very satisfying answer, but 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 that's not that's not really where I'm going, but I I think that that's an important question to ask. Thank you. Um we have in the middle. No. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful talk, um, Dr. Shakrabarty. It was fascinating. And um, I wanted to ask you more about um, this really interesting framing that you um, put on this history is that the Cold War wasn't this binary between communism and capitalism, but there was this third, it's a three-way war and decolonization was part of it. And that you mentioned that it's an under-theorized um, piece of the history in our field specifically. And I was wondering um, if you could speak a little bit more about how this has impacted our field today and um, the way that we do research on propaganda and disinformation, and particularly um, things like new forms of warfare, like cyber warfare, um, and where we might go from here, um, especially with this great story that you're telling. And um, yeah, just thanks again. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you for listening um, and asking great questions. Um, so um, part of this, part of the lack of engagement with the decolonization component of that history, um, I think has to do, um, so let me put it this way. The reason why I think it's important is because I think in media studies and communications, our theories of, of media, of democracy, of social movements are still really quite um, moored, moored, quite um, stuck in uh, Cold War framings. You know, and, and, and I didn't talk so much about the kind of, I, th I can't totally see you. I think you're the one who's looking at Dallas Smythe and dependency, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I didn't really talk about the dependency side of it, you know, the kind of political economy critique of the liberal um, uh, liberal media context within the Cold War. Um, and, you know, all of that work is important. You know, Dallas Smythe's work is important and um, Herb Schiller's work is important. And, you know, I talked about... Uh, Herman and Chomsky, et cetera. But there is a way in which there isn't, there's actively no engagement with questions of, of colonialism and race outside of capital, right? And so um, I, there, I think that, I think what becomes crucial is to kind of go back, um, you know, as we, as we think about decolonizing our field, um, I think it's, it's important to actually go back and read and reread um, the theorists and activists and thinkers of decolonization, right? I mean, that doesn't mean that we have to go back and romanticize these pasts, you know? But I think we have to go back and see what they were trying to do, what they tried to do, what they failed to do, why they failed to do it, um, and what are the kinds of questions they were raising, you know? And so um, I think that this is happening in some some corners of scholarly debate. So I, I, I referenced a few times the work of um, Adam Gerechu, who is a political scientist, political theorist. Um, and she has a fascinating book called World Making After Empire, where she's looking at the ways in which um, uh, Pan-Africanists uh, and, and um, uh, Afro, Afro-Caribbean, and African thinkers um, are questioning the terms of governance of a global economy in this same period, right, of the Cold War, but also decolonization. And I think that that kind of framing is a useful way for us to rethink what happened with the call for a new world international communications order, right? That's a debate 
that was very much about the redistribution of resources, but was also about a racial reckoning. And that part of it is, is kind of absent, right, in our, in our discussions and in our memories. And so I think that there's a way that we can kind of revisit some of these accepted kind of, you know, marks, markers in our field and, and, and go back and read things that have been long forgotten, sometimes because of language, um, but often because, um, you know, these are people who were not considered part of um, uh, our scholarship. So, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I think it's important to go back to the work of W.E.B. Du Bois and Franz Fanon and, you know, uh, Ambedkar in India and, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera, along with feminist scholars, uh, Claudia Jones on journalism, uh, for example, in, in the U.S. and in the U.K. So there's, there's ways in which we need to kind of revisit some of that work to help us question some of the theoretical assumptions, um, not just by, in terms of the liberal, um, liberal uh, uh, theories um, of media and democracy, but, but also to push us further when it comes to the dependency and political economy critiques as well. We have one uh, over there. Yeah, good evening, uh, Paula. Um, thank you for the lecture, that's very, very insightful. That's very, very nice. And I'm really trying to like link like the contents from your lecture to some kind of like uh, more like recent cases. And there's one particular term that's addressed in the lecture that's um, liberal illiberalism. That's kind of really stuck to me at the moment. Right. One case that I can think of at the moment is the like the Western, like the media concerns about the World Cup, like the past World Cups, like labor conditions. Where you see like, well, I mean, first of all, this World Cup is held in like this formerly like Oriental kind of land, you know, Qatar. And then like throughout the years before the World Cup, a lot of media and like NGOs, they really like criticize on like the labor conditions and exploitation in Qatar. And, you know, some, but rarely do these like media actually talk about like the supply chains and the companies behind them because it's, it's an international business holding a World Cup. And then we see like this rise of like international, like state media that gets, gains this like international media status, like Al Jazeera, like the Chinese state media, CGTN, mm -hmm. actually like slam back against the Western media on like the hypocrisy of it. So first question is like, do you still see some kind of like legacies from you know, like the contents of the lecture from the Western media. And the second question is that, have these like authoritarian medias actually learned a thing or two from this like liberal, illiberal modern? How, how does it work out in the future? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I mean, I completely agree with your reading of the World Cup. I mean, uh, my household are Brazil supporters, so I was very disappointed with the World Cup um, outcome myself. But you know, Qatar won the World Cup, right? It won it as a PR campaign for the Gulf states, which are authoritarian states. Um, and it won it partly by um, this um, embrace of the language, uh, Adil is somewhere here, we were just talking about this, um, of, of this ability to reconstitute, you know, Edward Said's critique of Orientalism, um, and by using the language of Orientalism to um, put up a, any kind of block against a critique um, uh, around, you know, whether it was labor rights or environmental rights or gender or, um, you know, larger questions of political freedom, all of that was deflected with this kind of um, reassessing a kind of, uh, of Orientalism for liberal illiberalism in that context, right? And I, I think that, yes, I mean, this is, this is where we are today with, um, so the period I was talking about, the early anti-colonial period from the 50s until the early 60s, and you know, maybe we can stretch it to the early 70s. Um, you know, there was a hope in a kind of anti-colonial nationalism um, that I think we can't really hold on to anymore, right? Um, I think whatever internationalist future there is, internationalist future, uh, internationalist progressive future, um, it can't be one based on a kind of patriarchal nationalism, right? And so um, 
in fact, the patriarchal nationalists who use the language of anti-colonialism um, are, uh, you know, doing terrible things, right? Um, um, and they are, in fact, reproducing um, a kind of um, inequality and in power, um, but they're using this language of anti-colonialism. You know, I think of um, India's uh, Hindu nationalist government that, that you know, likes to do this, um, as do, I think, um, Erdogan in Turkey, and, you know, we can go on and on and on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that um, part of um, the shrinking of what is considered legitimate political um, uh, debate um, has meant that um, there's a way in which the anti-colonial can be attached um, to projects that are anything but you know, anti-colonial. It's the, the the faces of the rulers might have changed, but they're they're far from this kind of anti-colonial vision um, that was the hope in this period. But there are new ways that anti-colonialism is being reimagined, and I think again through a kind of post-nationalist uh, feminism, through a recognition of difference, whether that's indigeneity or um, ethnic minorities. Um, so I think that there are, are ways in which um, we can see new new futures for the kind of anti-colonial. So the legacy of the kind of you know Lumumba um, anti-colonialism will find a different kind of um, uh, future. But um, um, but yes, it can be easily manipulated. And I think the Qatar example, the Gulf, the the a World Cup example is a perfect example of that kind of liberal illiberalism um, and its legacy. Thank you so much. Uh, we are running a bit out of time, so maybe one more last question or comment from the people in the back. Uh, we a have comment. Over the year. A comment would be appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's at the back. Um, hi, Dr. Corolla. Thank you so much for your um, informative session. Um, I just had a question. Um, you you were talking about um, how Iran and Guatemala, both those countries, um, they were on a movement towards self-determination. Um, they were taking steps to nationalize their economies, but the, what they had in common was that in both cases, the US, um, the West intervened and um, toppled that process. Um, I think there was a similar process in Chile as well. When Alan Day was um, reorganizing the national economy with the help of um, a British social scientist, um, Stratford Beer, is are those cases are these cases similar, or what do you think on them? Yeah. So the my fourth case is actually Chile. Alan Day's Chile. So that I didn't I didn't get to Chile just because you know of of time. Um, it's you know it's just I already feel like I'm doing such a shoddy job covering these you know, incredibly complex histories and stories. So I didn't want to rush in through all four, but Chile is a very important case um, because what you see with Chile is not just the extension of an illiberal, uh, a liberal illiberalism, but you see actually the birth of neoliberalism, right? So Chile and um, the post Allende coup is, Chile is the, is the laboratory of neoliberalism. And so, um, the Allende government's, um, again, social democratic attempts at um, some e political economic reforms were overturned drastically. And uh, the Pinochet um, uh, dictatorship that comes into power is, of course, famous for um, bringing in the Chicago boys and becoming the kind of birthplace of neoliberalism. What I'm trying to do here, though, is show that it doesn't all just begin in Chile and then, you know, mutate into Reagan and Thatcher in the 1980s and then the rest of the world, that actually you have a kind of um, uh, birth of neoliberalism in this kind of moment of de decolonization, a racially based birth of neoliberalism that economic historians have already um, uncovered. And so I think it's important to kind of trace uh, the, the, the um, genealogy of this kind of um, economic policy that basically says that certain people are not able 
to um, don't have the kind of you know, I find the Iran case so interesting because Mossadegh has a PhD in finance and uh, he is seen as, um, he's painted by the media as being, you know, hysterical and um, weak and ill and unable to actually implement a kind of Keynesian economic reform policy. So I, that's the kind of um, trajectory that I'm trying to map and Chile is a very, very important part of that story. Thank you. I think we are about to wrap up. And again, uh, I want to thank everyone for attending this meet, uh, talk today and for colleagues organizing and, of course, to Paula. So we are holding this reception with some light refreshment. Maybe we want to invite people to join us uh, for some light refreshment and maybe continue carry on this conversation if you'd like. You can go through this uh, door. It's a very uh, short route to that. Thank you, everyone.